morning. Great to see you all at worship. Uh, Happy New Year. Are you all pumped up and excited for the year ahead? Yeah, I didn't think so either. Um, Maybe it'll be better than 2023. Who knows, you know? So one of the things that I love about the Scriptures is that as a whole, the, the book doesn't just tell us a whole bunch of things we should or shouldn't be doing. But at times, the, the authors of the Scriptures, under the inspiration of the Spirit, begin to unpack much deeper ideas to talk about the why and the reasoning behind the things that we do. And I want to unpack some of that out of a particular book this morning. So who knows much about the Corinthian church or about Corinth the city? Anybody know anything at all about Corinth other than two books were written by Paul the Apostle? So let me help you out a little bit. So Paul the Apostle planted a church in Corinth. Uh, He writes two letters to it. They are phenomenal books, really helpful books to us. They remain as relevant today uh, for the modern church trying to follow Jesus in the 21st century world as they were relevant for the church in Corinth, which was a Roman city, uh, perhaps a little bit similar to to Cape Town, very metropolitan, very, very uh, loads of cultures, different languages spoken on the streets. And the church in Corinth that Paul planted, a lot smaller than this, um, but was probably pretty similar in makeup to this church in the sense that diversities of cultures and languages. Like English people, quickly, hands up. Okay, Afrikaans people, hands up. Yes, there's more of you. I think they might, man, we, have to, we have to do that again. Um, but, but you understand that, that, that there's a diversity in this congregation that I love. I mean, our neighborhood is, is quite kind of monocultural, but I love the fact that we're drawing different people in different cultures. And this was the church in Corinth. It had a whole lot of different people. Some were of very humble origins. Others were of noble birth. There were Greeks. Uh, there, there were Jews. But the majority of the church would have been Roman citizens. And uh, Corinth was this really diverse city. And the Books are so fascinating because the issues that they were facing, as you read through the books, Paul is writing about issues that they were facing, telling them how to deal with these things as a church, and and they remain relevant for our current generation. In fact, the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Uh, And so we tend to make the similar kind of mistakes. And so these two letters are really helpful for us as we try and navigate a world that has rejected Jesus. And so Paul writes these letters to these, uh, to these people in the city of Corinth. Now, now Corinth, even okay, the, Romans, the Romans were not a particularly moral society. If you don't know much about Roman culture, they were quite hedonistic at points. Now, even in Roman terms, Corinth was quite the city, okay? It was the place you went to go and feed all of those pleasures. It was the Vegas of the modern world, and what, uh, of the ancient world at least. And what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And that was Corinth. In fact, Corinth was so bad in its reputation, they actually coined a new Greek word, which was Corinthiasomai, which meant to live like a Corinthian. That's how bad it was, that you actually had to coin a new word because they were so immoral. And so into the midst of this like massively immoral city, this church is planted by Paul the Apostle. He's now writing these letters from prison to the church because he has heard stories coming back where all sorts of external cultural pressures are pressing in onto the church, trying to shape the church's thinking. And, and so he wants them to think much more biblically than as Romans. And so he writes these letters. If you think that Corinth was bad at Paul's time, it had been that way for centuries. In fact, at one point, uh, a, a couple of decades before Paul planted the church in, uh, in Corinth, there was a, a hill on top of that was a temple to Aphrodite. There were at one point a thousand ritual prostitutes priestesses, they called them, uh, where you would go and sleep with a prostitute to appease the gods in some way. This is how deeply embedded into that city deep immorality was. And you cannot imagine being a Christian in a city like that and not having it affect you in some way. So if you read through the two books, you will see these outside pressures and perhaps recognize something of the pressures that are pushing in on us. And as Michelle mentioned, We'll talk about sex and food. I'll address them, but but I want to get under them because the things that we do with our bodies are driven by ideologies and by ideas and by philosophies, and I want to shift some of those things uh, in our minds. Colin's going to be reading for us. It's out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, uh, and let's hear the Word of God. I have the right to do anything, you say. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, 
but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your temples are, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Thanks, Colin. So when I'm preaching, I often try and think of three different kinds of people, depending on the kind of sermon. Uh, it may be that I think about really committed Christians, less committed Christians, and then non-Christians who may be here. And you try and address those uh, kind of groupings. And in today's sermon, I, I want to, perhaps if I could, address three different generations, because you think quite differently from each other. So old fogies, um, you know, you have a certain way of thinking. And then there are people like me, middle-aged people, we have a certain way of thinking. And then young people, young people are just weird. And every generation of older people has said that about young people. You know, back in my day, and I hear myself saying things like that. It's like, oh, good, no, this is terrible. I'm sounding like my dad. In fact, I often hear his voice come out of my mouth, and I wonder how could this be? But the reality is you think very differently from each other. Okay, so young people, you'll listen to your parents say some certain things, and you go, oh, that is, like, this is ridiculous. And then even worse, you talk to your grandparents, and your grandparents say some things, and you're just like, that is so old-fashioned. So maybe if I make a comment right out the gate, especially for you young people, okay, at some point, okay, at some point, you will be old, and all of the ideas that you thought were so progressive and so cool, some other young person will be, oh, that's so, so old-fashioned. And then you'll be really old, and they'll go, oh, quaint. It's just granny. It's just ridiculous. Okay, so it's called chronological snobbery. So be very careful about doing chronological snobbery this morning, because it is the arrogance of every generation to think that they are more progressive, more together, better, whatever it happens to be, than the generation before them. The second thing is that the way that we think, at least in the current generation, the, the stuff has been pressed out on social media and all other platforms, that we think is so progressive is actually just a rehash of things that other generations were doing long before you did them. Whatever you may think about sexuality and food, I'm telling you the Romans did it first. And so what you think is so cool, it was cool long before you thought it was cool. It was a little bit like when granny's clothes become cool again, you know, I, I, like fashion works on a kind of 20 year Cycle, so you were cool, then you're not cool, then suddenly in middle age you're cool again, and then you're not cool, and then granny pitches up with the same dress or whatever it is that you've got on, and granny's cool again. I think that seems to be at least how it works. So I just want to really help you young people, just listen to some of the reasoning Paul makes. Listen to some of the thinking that Paul is challenging in this letter in the Corinthian church, because I think the stuff that's happening in our culture today around some of these things is exactly the same stuff that was happening to the church in Corinth who were deeply influenced by Roman thinking. And if you think your thinking is new and progressive and something extraordinary, let me tell you, the Romans did it long before you did, and they did it a lot better than you did. So the Roman culture was saturated with this idea of indulging their pleasures. Paul writes to them at one point and calls them hedonists. We, just, we, we have these desires and we just fill these desires with as many pleasures as we possibly can. In fact, the highest ideals are to follow your desires, and the, especially the pleasurable ones, and to never limit oneself. In fact, the great sin in these kind of cultures is not to follow your heart, right? And listen, every single animated Disney movie Without fail, go and watch them. At some point, the lead character will be told, just go and follow your heart. Now, I don't know about you, but the people that are in the middle age and the older age, 
young people. Go talk to them and ask them how well it worked out for them at following your heart every time. And I'll tell you, more often than not, it doesn't end particularly well. And so Paul, realizing that the church he had planted was being deeply affected by the issues of the culture pressing in on them, this Roman culture shaping their thinking, their ideology, their, their morality, he pens these two particularly profound letters. And he makes a passing reference to food in this particular section. And if there is a subject I've never heard a sermon on, help me out, anybody heard a sermon on gluttony ever? Next Sunday, one, okay, next Sunday, gluttony, okay, all the fat people, tell them all to come, we'll give, no, we won't, okay. But it's interesting, it's interesting in a country where more than 50% of our population are overweight and 27% of our population are obese, that most of us have never heard a sermon on gluttony. In fact, it was one of the ancient seven deadly sins that the church spoke about. We don't talk about these things. Now, it's interesting that the people in the Corinthian church, the argument that they were making is that if I have an appetite for something, I've got to fill it. And I will fill it as much as I can in as many different ways as I can. Food for the stomach, stomach for food. I got this thing, it gnaws at me, and every time it gnaws at me, I'm going to put something in it. And then even when it's full, I'll look at something else, and I'll want that, and I'll put it in it too. And we will just keep filling ourselves. My, my Instagram feed is filled with ever-increasing reels of things you can do with bacon, okay? Like, I love, like, there is something about bacon and pork crackling. I think it may be the single most powerful evangelistic tool that we have at our disposal. Um, and then it's like, you make, like... Just basically more bacon. That seems to be the answer. So you make bacon and you put more bacon on top of it. And you make a bacon burger and you put bacon on top of it. And it just, it like seems that it's like never good enough. There's always more, some like additional crazy level you can take this to. But at, at a far more serious kind of level, there is a, a worrying trend of influences, and you'll see this on the cover of women's magazines, of body positivity. And it's not body positivity, it's abusive to people. Now, I, I'm, let me be right up front clear on this. I don't think every woman needs to look like every other woman, okay? I don't think you need to be a stick figure supermodel. But what we are seeing is this ever-increasing trend of you can fill your mouth with all sorts of stuff, you can weigh 190 kilos, and despite every healthcare professional telling you you are sick, they are being intolerant, and they're being abusive to me, and it's verbal violence. Just in the last four months, there have been several influencers who are part of this body positivity, body positivity movement who have died under the age of 35. Every single one of them died because of complications caused by their weight. And, and this is a pervasive culture that's driving through our world. Now, in Paul's time, the Romans indulged in food to a level that I think even we might find outrageous. If you go for a nice dinner at someone's house, you may have several courses. What the Romans would do um, is at least partially what I do. I arrive and there's always like snacks and starters, and those are rad. You're like, do, 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 do. and then you're like, main course comes, and you're like, oh man, I'm like already full, right? Now, I should learn to be like a Roman. What the Romans would do is like you would gorge yourself and starter, you go outside, you vomit up your food, you go back in, you do main course until you're sick, you go back outside, you vomit up that, and you go back for pudding. In fact, they actually had vomitories, places to go and do this. But, but I, wonder, I wonder if that same thinking is not pervading our culture. If you have the desire... Fulfill it. You deserve to be happy. Don't limit yourself. Follow your heart. And then Paul begins to address sexuality as another example of, I have an appetite and it must be fulfilled. And of all the human impulses, few are as powerful as the human sexual drive. And few things have been more destructive to human society than to allow sexuality to run rampant. And so in our current culture, the mantra of, if it feels good, do it, is something that many people live by. So let me play the generational game, okay? So old people, uh, when you thought about sexuality, like things like sex before marriage, your general thinking was, it's not the done thing, right? It's just culturally we don't do that. Then people like myself, so those are what we call pre-modernist thinking. Um, there's no real thinking around this. It's just the rules. 
And then modern generation came along, and this is anybody between, say, about 45 and maybe 60, maybe even 70. Those kind of people, we went, we were a little more pragmatic about this. So we don't have sex before marriage, because if you do, you might have a child out of wedlock, or you, you, maybe you get pregnant with, some, uh, sorry, you get an STD of some sort. So it was, it was kind of like, there was some reasoning behind it. The younger generation, anybody in this room that is under the age of 35, does not think about it in a sense of, we don't do it because it's not the done thing. And most of the problems around the pragmatic side of things, those have been resolved. Medication, condoms, there's a whole lot of things you can do to prevent those bad things happening. And so our current generation lives by the mantra, if it feels good, do it. The sole descriptor of modern morality is whether it feels good to me or not. And if it does, it's right. And if it doesn't, it's wrong. It's a very, very dangerous place to get to. And it's the kind of thinking that drove the Roman world. It might be worth being a little bit clearer about what Paul meant by sexual immorality when he writes about it in this passage. The scriptures are really clear about what sex should look like. Any sexual activity outside of a marriage between one man, one woman for life, any sexuality in a relationship that is not a marriage relationship between one man and one woman for life is against what God intended. Affairs, cohabitation, pornography, homosexuality, the list is endless. They are outside of what God intended for us. And so Jesus says something at one point, which Paul quotes in this particular letter to the, to the Corinthian church. Jesus said, a man shall leave his father and mother, take to himself a wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Paul quotes it. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. And what's happened in our culture, instead of a man leaving his mother and father, taking himself a wife, and then the two become one flesh, what we do is we become one flesh, and then we realize maybe we should marry this person, but we haven't even left home yet. We're still living in our parents' house and we're 26 years old. Like we have got this thing totally backwards to what the scriptures teach us to do. And so part of what Paul is do doing to this church is trying to shift their thinking about their behavior. He's challenging all of their so highly held ideals. Our cultures are asking what is pleasurable? Like, how do I maximize my personal happiness? How do I maximize my pleasures? And food and sex are just two of the places that we are trying to do this. And let me tell you, God is not against pleasure. Let me just help you people out. Guess who invented sex? Jesus, okay? And guess who invented bacon? Jesus. So you can have sex and you can have bacon. But, but, but there are, there are boundaries around how we do this. And what is even more important is that the thinking that drives our actions needs to change about those things. And what Paul is challenging is the idea that seeking pleasure should be your highest ideal. Just because you've got a belly doesn't mean you get to fill it with everything that your eyes see. Just because you're a sexual being, which every single person in this room is, does not mean that you need to follow every desire of your heart. Now, of course, any person with a mindset shaped by our current culture is going to say something like, it's my body and it's my choice. You have heard this over and over and over again. Some of you are thinking that right now. And Paul acknowledges it, but he says that not everything that you have the right to do is going to benefit you in the long term. So one of the great gifts that God has given to us is the ability to make choices. And Paul is saying, you can choose whatever you want to do. You can choose to follow God. You can choose to reject God. You can choose to overeat or you can choose to eat healthily. You can choose to have sex with anybody or you can choose to have sex within a marriage. You have choices that you can make and you can make any of them, Paul is saying. But he's saying not everything is beneficial. And maybe that's some of the questions we need to be asking ourselves. What is going to be good for me and the people around me and the future of my life. Because one of the things that I think we're facing in this current world is we love talking about rights, but we don't like talking about the consequences that come with those rights. So one of the things that I've seen a lot of, I love extreme sports. And so you'll find a lot of these athletes, they decide they don't want to do the job thing, right? So you, you get your van and you just move from place to place doing some extreme sport, which is all fine and well, until you finally fall off your snow skis because you were going down some crazy cool wire and you break both your legs irreparably and Red Bull drops your sponsorship. And the next thing, we have a Kickstarter campaign trying to raise funds for your medical care. And I'm like, hold on, I would also like to do crazy things. 
However, I decided it might be better to have a job and medical aid than doing those crazy things. And now you want me to pay for your irresponsibility? There are consequences to our actions. And Paul is saying, yeah, you can do whatever you want to do, but maybe you need to ask, is this good for me? And I'm not hearing that question asked in our culture. In fact, when people do raise the question, it's considered hate speech. That is a very dangerous place to get to. Many years ago, a young man, his mom came to see me. He must have been about 21 at the time. Uh, he'd had some major life crises, most of it spawned by his mother, who at 14 had given him his first ecstasy tablet. They'd taken ecstasy together. By the time I saw him at 21, he was a long-term drug addict. He'd been on and off cocaine and was now a heroin addict. Uh, he came to see me because he'd overdosed, and he lived in an apartment in town. The only reason he survived was that he lived two minutes' walk away from what is still, I think, Christian Barnum Memorial Hospital, and his friend carried him there, foaming at the mouth, and they saved his life. They resussed him in the emergency room, and then as part of the work that they did on him that evening, they gave him uh, blood work, and it turns out that he was also HIV positive because along with the drugs that his mother exposed him to, she told him, you can do whatever you want to do with your body because, hey, it's fun, isn't it? It's just a bit of harmless fun, you know, kids having sex. And so people are saying, I can do what I want. And Scripture is saying, you can, but your choices carry consequences. And we better be asking ourselves what is beneficial rather than simply what is pleasurable. And I've seen this in my own ministry, and I saw it in my own life when I was younger. I'm sure most of you that went to some youth group at some point, you have a talk about sexuality, and some teenager sticks up his hand, and the question he asks is... How far is too far? Thank you. I think half of my group asked that. And every time I've run one of these groups, it's the wrong blooming question. You see, because how far is too far is going, what's the maximum pleasure I can get away with? And I just wonder if a teenager said, hey, what do you think will be good for me long term? What do you think will maximize the possibility of me having a healthy and happy marriage? But when you're dumb and 16 which we all are when we're 16. We're not asking those kind of questions. Maybe we should. And as Christians, we should be asking ultimately what will honor Jesus. So culture is saying what's pleasurable. Paul is saying at least one of the questions you've got to be asking is, is this beneficial? But then he keeps going deeper and he gets us to finally ask the question, who do you belong to? So culture is saying we're our own person and we are the highest authority. And listen, every parent who's had a kid has had the kids say to them at some point, you don't tell me what to do. Hey, am I the only one? I'm sure it's happened to you. And then you say what my dad said to me when I try to pull that stunt. As long as you live under my house, you live by my rules. Right? That's how it works. It's my body and it's my choice is the cultural narrative. What incenses me about those kinds of statements is the profound arrogance of that position. I've spoken before on abortion. I could go on it for a month of Sundays. It's not your body. The child growing inside you is distinct from you at a genetic, biological level. And even more so for the feminists, if that child is a woman, who is defending her rights? Who gives her voice to say, it's my body, it's my choice? It is the arrogance that drives this generation that we have these silly sayings like, it's my truth. What an arrogant position to think that you define the truth. And Paul is saying to the church, man, you guys have got this so confused. Like you're thinking like Romans and you need to think like Christ followers. And history tends to repeat itself and I feel like we're in a very similar place. And what scripture is teaching here, this is Paul going deeper into this. It's not just about your behavior it's not just about the thinking, it's about what's happening in your heart. He says this, that either you will be mastered by your desires or you will submit to the master of all. I have the right to do anything, that's what you're saying. But Paul says, I am not going to be mastered by anything. If I'm going to have a master, I'd much rather it be Jesus than anything or anyone else. And Paul is writing this because he, like many of us, have chosen to submit ourselves to the master who will care for us and who seeks nothing but blessing over our lives. And let me tell you, all of these desires and these appetites that you try and fulfill and you try and shove every bit of pleasure into them that you can, they will make you slaves to them. 
You just ask that person who tries to put bacon on bacon, and then it's just not enough bacon. It just always leaves you unsatisfied, or your, your eyes are bigger than your stomach is, and you shove it all in, and then you walk around feeling absolutely horrible. And you listen to people who have chosen paths of sexuality where they try and fulfill every sexual pleasure and every conceivable permutation that they can, and yet it leaves them hungry and longing for intimacy which is what God intended for us. <laughs> Please, turn your phones off on Sundays. It's really not that hard. So what Paul is saying is you can make those choices, but they may land up enslaving you. Speak to any person who has a bond. Who owns your house? Not you. And you know fully that that is not the truth. I remember sitting with a family in this congregation. They, had the, they just bought this magnificent home. It was kind of everything I like in a home. It had these massive patio doors onto this beautiful lawn, the leafy trees and the back drop. It was just, it was glorious. Inside, no ceilings. It had those open A-frame ceilings, loads of space and air. It was glorious. And then they were telling me about the house. And then, then the husband said to me, the problem is I feel like the house owns us and not the other way around. Welcome to the world of fulfilling all of your desires. They will hold you in bondage. And what Paul is saying is, rather, rather submit yourselves to Jesus and allow him to be your master, for he seeks nothing but blessing over your life. And our bodies, Paul just burrowing down into this, Paul is saying our bodies are not just there to fulfill our pleasures with sex and food. The body, he says, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, like like this thing that I have, this meat suit that I get to wear until Jesus takes me home, it's actually quite important. It's made by Jesus. He watched me, I'm told in the Psalms, as I was knit together inside my mother. All of the days ordained for me were written in his book before one of them came to be. Like God loves me, including my body. And whilst it is getting slightly older, you can see by my awesome haircut and my slightly deteriorating eyesight, with this eye, I can't see any faces or smiles. Um, the reality is you're going to watch me get older Sunday after Sunday. After, it's, it's inevitable reality. But one day, I'm going to get another body made for heaven. It'll be this body in its best possible form, and it will last for eternity. Jesus loves our bodies. Do not make the distinction of trying to separate our bodies as something that is secular and then our spirituality or our souls as something that is sacred. You don't do that. That's platonic thinking. This is, that's not Jesus thinking at all. It, Paul is saying the body was made for the Lord. It's got to change the way that you think about how you do things in your body. It's, it's just got to change the way that you think about flesh. It's got to change the way you think about sex. It's got to change the way that you think about food. But then Paul just keeps going, man. He starts hammering it in. Verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Boah, that should blow your mind. Because Christ lives in this. Like he's here with me. Wherever I may go, he's at work in my body. That's got to change the way that you do things with your body. Because the young Christian couple who live together before marriage and are sleeping together are drawing Jesus into the midst of their sexual immorality every time. And then married couples, every time you are sexually intimate, Jesus is rejoicing with you because sex actually becomes an act of worship. It is something beautiful gifted to us by God. And when we take the beautiful things that God gives us and we use them in the way that he intended them to be used, that becomes worship. Are you good at making money? You live in Prodi Valley. Yes, that's the right answer, okay? That is, look here, it can be an evil thing when you use it for selfish endeavors. I can't remember who coined the phrase. Somebody will remind me afterwards. Somebody once said, work as hard as you can to make as much money as you can to give away as much as you can. That's the point of your money earning capacity. It's to be generous with it. Your body's ability to have sex, it's beautiful when it's practiced inside the boundaries of a loving marriage between one man and one woman for life. It becomes an act of worship. Every time you take anything that's in your mind, anything of your body, and you use it to bless the world, because that's what Jesus wants to see happen. He wants this world blessed. It becomes an act of worship. Our bodies belong to Jesus, 
and are members with them. And he keeps going, flee from sexual immorality because all other sins a person commits are outside of the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. You may recall Paul writes to the church in Rome, another Roman thinking church because it's Rome. And, and he says there, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Like, what a great idea. He doesn't say come sing songs. He doesn't say pray prayers. He doesn't say read Bible. Do all of those things. But literally offer everything you do as an, as an act of worship, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God because this is your true and proper worship, and do not conform to the pattern of this world. That's what he's saying to this church in Corinth. Don't think like the blooming Corinthians. Don't think like them. God has got something far better for you. And then we close with Paul making this final and most beautiful point. Do you not know that your bodies, listen to this, that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? That should, that should change the way we think about our bodies. If you've ever been to Europe and you go to these beautiful cathedrals, there's something about the architecture that makes you want to talk quiet. Like you're in the street, da 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 and you walk through the front door, and all of a sudden you quiet and you whisper. There's something, there's something about these rising columns and these stained glass windows and these high ceilings and the steeple. There is something about the architecture that even for a, a, a total unbeliever walks in, and there's something almost sacred about that space. You and your bodies are like that, for you have been made in the image of God. You're a dwelling place for Jesus. It's got to change how you think about these things. Your body and you were made as a place where God would live, no longer in the cathedral on the street corner, but in you. So Christians choose not to ask what is pleasurable, but rather what is beneficial. And then we need to learn to say, I am not my own, I'm his. For you are not your own, Paul writes to this church, you were bought at a price. Jesus considers you of such value that he would offer his life as a ransom for yours. Like this person is worth so much, like take me. That's what he did at the cross. Take me. I want them to live. Let my body go to the cross. It's got to change the way that you think about these things. And this isn't just about some morality here. I'm not just thinking, oh, this is the right thing to do. Just do it because the Bible says so. I'm not even trying to get you to think about it like, do it because it's beneficial to you or because you won't get STDs or you won't get... No, no. Your bodies were made with a purpose and the purpose of your body is to bring glory and honor to Jesus. Now, for some of you, your bodies are like those temples that you would find or these cathedrals that you would find around Europe. There, there's something in them that, that raises a sense of awe, a sense of the sacred, but they're empty and there's no worshiping congregation that meets there. And yet for most of us, we're a little, little bit like this building. I'm not sure anybody's ever walked into the door and lowered their voice coming into this building. Even if you come in the week, you'll, like there's nothing about this building you're gonna walk in and go, oh, wow, man, I feel so small. Like God, God must be amazing. Like look, it's a blooming hall, okay? It's nothing, but you know what makes it beautiful? You come on a Sunday morning, you go, this place is pumping. Like look at all these people. Listen to the noise. Watch them praying with each other. Watch them laughing. Watch them sharing life, not only on Sunday, but midweek as well. Watch the way they raise their hands as they sing his praises. I, I think some of you are like empty cathedrals made for the glory of God, carrying in you and in your body something of the fingerprints of God, but he's not there yet. And if that is you, man, I cannot, I cannot make it more clear. Invite Jesus in and it will be gloriously messy and you will love every moment of it. This is why most of us here choose to live the lives we do, not because it's the right thing, but because we're his. Like he bought me and I don't want to be enslaved to things that are going to put me into bondage and are going to destroy me. I want to be, I want to be a servant of the master who will bless me. That's what I've chosen to do, and I know a bunch of you have as well. And I would invite those, those that haven't to do that today. There's this line in one of our songs that is possibly the most beautiful line 
I don't know. Be careful how you say these things because it should be the Bible, right? But I don't know. This song, I think, might have the greatest line of any song. Let's keep it at that so I don't blaspheme the Scriptures in some way. Heaven has no more to give. It's, it's the most beautiful line. Like whatever you may be asking God of today, He has given you His Son. And that's why you can say, He is mine and I am His. I belong to Him. I have been bought with a price. There is nothing more for heaven to offer. There is nothing of greater value than Christ giving himself for you. And that's why Paul encourages the church to think differently about their sexuality, to think differently about their food. That's why I'm asking you to do that too. I don't care whether you're 15 or 95. Makes no difference. Whether you're an old pre-modern thinker or this young post-modern hipster who thinks they're so cool. Like, I don't mind. But you're not your own and your body is not your own. You are his And what greater treasure is there than that? Let's pray. Jesus, what a gift you are. That long before any of us thought about loving you, you loved us. And it wasn't just 2,000 years ago as you were going to the cross that you thought about loving us. We're told in the Scriptures, Lord, that you and the Father and the Spirit thought about this in eternity past. And we love you for that. And so I would ask, Lord, that you would somehow help us to live our lives differently in light of what you have done. That we would think differently about our bodies and the things that we do with them. That we would rethink the the philosophy with which we run our lives. And I would, I would pray, Lord, that you would help us to deal with some of our chronological snobbery because I think older people can look at younger people and, and think they're crazy and young people can look at older people and think they're so old-fashioned. And the reality is, Lord, whether we're young or old, we've had pressures pushing in on our lives that are not biblical pressures. There are things that shape our thinking that do not come from you. And I pray that as we reflect on all that you have done for us, Jesus, that we would get to a point of going, it's not my body, it belongs to him. And I willingly submit to him because he first loved me and offered himself for me. Amen. We're gonna do something a little bit different than uh, we usually do at Protea Valley Church. When I grew up in church, um, at the end of every sermon, we had to have an invitation song. That was the thing. You had to have it. And we don't usually do those, but this actually is an invitation song. Um, But it's a song with um, sort of a warning. The song's called Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. It's my favorite hymn. Um, It's why it's it's tattooed on my arm. Um, It's what one of the things that got me through COVID um, when I was in the ICU was this song. Um, and I realized at that point that this is not a song that you should sing lightly. It's not, it's, it's, we could just put words up on the screen and people just sing them because they're up on the screen, but we don't want to do that um, because I only want you to sing the song if this is what you mean, if this is what you are saying. Um, and uh, so we don't take these things lightly, um, but also we don't want you people to look around and go, who's not singing? Okay, who's not, you know. So we're just going to kind of sing this over you guys as a prayer. And if you want to join in, that's great. Um, But uh, And then there's a chorus that Chris Tomlin took the the old song. This is from the 1800s. And he he took it and updated the melody and added a chorus, of course, uh, called Here. And it says, Here am I, all of me. Take my life. It's all for thee. Um, If you want to join in on that, it's great. But um, the song was written by a lady named Frances Havergal. And she, uh, she was the daughter of a pastor. And her whole life, she was just sickly. She was frail, um, and she didn't uh, get to play with the other kids and do all the stuff that they did. And she just was weak her whole life, had a frail constitution. And, um, uh, and so she didn't have a job or anything, or a husband or anything like that. She just wrote worship songs. That's what she did. Um, she wrote hundreds of them. Uh, this is the only one that anybody still sings. Um, but if you're going to get one, this is the one. Yeah. So... Um, Yeah, let's just sing Take My Life. Take my life and let it be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee Take my moments and my days 
Let them flow in ceaseless praise Take my hands and let them move At the impulse of thy love Take my feet and let them be Swift and beautiful for thee Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King Take my lips and let them be Filled with messages from me Take my silver and my gold Not a mite would I withhold Take my intellect and use every power as you choose. Here am I, Here am I all, of me. all of me. Take my Take my will and make it thine It shall be no longer mine Take my heart, it is thine own It shall be thy royal throne Take my love, my Lord I pour At your feet its treasure store Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Here am I. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Let's pray together. Uh, we really do want to have our lives shaped by You, Jesus, molded by You into Christ-likeness. And in a short while, we'll head out of this building and we'll have opportunities to take our lives and to use them in a way that blesses others. And we will do that, Lord, but we want to start by doing the one thing that you call us to do, and that is as a people, we're called to pray. And so we do want to pray for our world. I pray for a generation of young people that are being sold an ideology that you can have all the freedoms you want without consequences, and it's simply not true. Pray for those, Lord, that are ultimately in bondage to their desires and unwittingly following paths that they had no idea would take them to a place of addiction pray that you'd free them, Lord, that they would find in you the peace that surpasses all understanding. Pray for a generation, Lord, that is growing up without the knowledge of the good news of the gospel. And I pray that you would raise up a church, Lord, around the world who would be bold and courageous, who would speak the truth, but would do so in such a way that they'd be winsome, that their, their speech would be like salt, savoring. And then there are things on grand scales internationally that are happening, Lord, in so many complexities. We think of the war in the Middle East and the polarization of that and then the situation in Ukraine that's been going for more than two years and 
It just seems nobody on either side wants to listen to each other and understand each other's perspective. And I believe, Lord, that there are things of evil and of deep spiritual evil that are operating even in international ways. And I want to pray, Lord, that you would break the bondage that the evil one holds this world enslaved to. I want to pray against the works of the evil one, against his power and against his lies that he so easily sows. And then finally, Jesus, we do pray for us that we would not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And so would you send us out of this building to take all that you've given us in our bodies, our intellects, our bodies, our skill sets, our work, our money, all of these things. And in some, some way, Lord, we can, we can transform the world. We don't just want to pray your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven, but we want to be part of bringing your kingdom here on earth. So help us to do that well. And so we ask your blessing over us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I hope that was a blessing to you. Again, we'd love you to plug in and connect to us and to be the church rather than just watching church. And so head to our website, www.proteavalleychurch.org, and you will find all of the relevant information there. We'd love to help plug you into a midweek community. We'd love to help you come and gather with us on Sunday mornings. We'd love to help find a space for you to serve. One of the ways that you can start serving right now is to scan the code now for SnapScan. We'd love you to partner with us. Ministry costs money. We fund a whole bunch of international missionaries around the world who are taking the good news to the nations. We have absolutely loads of phenomenal life transforming local ministries in various places in our neighborhoods, in local townships, uh, through other organizations who we partner with. And we would love you to partner with us and that out of your money, we would see fruit, a harvest for Jesus kingdom. So please do scan that code and partner with us as we seek to see Jesus made famous amongst the nations here and right to the very ends of the earth. I pray that you have a great week worshiping Jesus and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is our heavenly father and the friendship and fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Go in peace and serve Jesus this week well. Amen.